Defining the African-American ecclesial tradition is similar to defining the Reformed tradition in that it is both clear what marks the tradition as a separate tradition and clear that the tradition is in no way monolithic. The African-American church tradition is marked by just as much complexity and diversity of opinions and perspectives on the relationship between church and society as any other tradition. A couple of clarifying points of language are crucial as we start to explore this rich tradition. First, we will sometimes use the terms African American and Black interchangeably. This does not mean that every person who would identify with one of those labels would interchangeably identify with the other, but it is sometimes helpful to consider the ways that the African American community intersects and interacts with the global Black community. A very similar linguistic move is being made by Esau Macaulay, for example, in his recent book, Reading While Black, African American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope. Our discussion will primarily focus on the black church in America, with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as the representative example. Secondly, we might ask a preliminary question as to why the African-American ecclesial tradition warrants being considered as a separate tradition. Couldn't we just consider black Baptists with all other Baptists, or black Methodists with all other Methodists, as far as tradition goes? Perhaps we would answer yes, if we were only considering these traditions on the grounds of doctrinal statements. But the answer is decidedly no, because we are exploring these traditions with regard to their theology of society and culture. And the African American church has consistently exhibited ways of interacting with society and culture that greatly differ from their predominantly white denominational counterparts. As we will see, the African American ecclesial tradition is marked by an overt recognition of the social location and status of black people in America as marginalized, oppressed, and devalued. Therefore, black churches have often played a prophetic and critical role in the wider society by pointing out and decrying injustice toward black people and black communities. If you're interested in exploring the history of African American churches, see the book Free at Last, The Gospel in the African American Experience by Carl Ellis. In December 1955, a 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. stood in a church building in Montgomery, Alabama. He stood somewhat hesitantly unsure of what might come next or what his role in what came next might be. Those of us familiar with Dr. King from his I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington in 1963 might not immediately recognize this younger King. In the days just previous, Rosa Parks had taken her courageous stand on a Montgomery bus, refusing to give up her seat to a white person. Now a massive crowd had gathered to hear whether there would be a citywide bus boycott and how it would be conducted. The local black leaders had been discussing who would be the face of leadership for the boycott, and a lot had fallen to King. But he had just been installed as the pastor of his church, and he was unsure about taking on an additional role in the socio-political sphere. He wanted to focus on his first pastorate. He reluctantly agreed, though, and the rest, as they say, is history. King would be the face of the boycott for the next year, and this leadership would only propel him to broader and more prominent leadership in the civil rights movement that would span the next decade and beyond. While continuing in ministerial roles throughout his life at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church and Ebenezer Baptist Church, Dr. King also helped found the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which provided structure to the civil action taken by African Americans throughout the civil rights movement. He traveled all over the Southern U.S. and many places in the wider U.S. He helped lead the March on Washington in 1963. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, and he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, on April 4, 1968. 
just hours after giving his final speech on April 3rd, called I've Been to the Mountaintop. The story I briefly recounted about the beginning of King's leadership of the Montgomery bus boycott illustrates well the reason he is a good represent, rep representative of the African-American church tradition. Long before the bus boycott in Montgomery came a calling to church ministry, to preaching and pastoring. Long before the Nobel Peace Prize came a seminary education. Long before I Have a Dream came Love Your Enemies, a particularly powerful sermon King preached in 1954. King was a churchman, and we can see that even in his reluctance to take on the leadership of a movement aimed at social change, when he had just begun his first full-time pastorate. As King said himself, the church has always been a second home for me. But it is precisely this tension between church ministry and social action that King embodies so well and that African-American churches have continuously embodied throughout their history. In the tradition of Frederick Douglass, King articulated that a gospel message that spoke of spiritual freedom, but left people in a state of political, economic, or social bondage, was no gospel at all. The good news must be good news for every aspect of life, and for every kind of person. Here are King's own words. Any religion that professes to be concerned about the souls of men and is not concerned about the economic conditions that damn the soul, the social conditions that corrupt men, and the city governments that cripple them, is a dry, dead, do-nothing religion in need of new blood. So it is Dr. King's theology, his understanding of God's justice and righteousness and love and mercy, and his understanding of God's care for and sovereignty over all of life, that forms the foundation for his social action. And he never gave up that foundation, even as his journey led him toward more social action and less local church ministry. He never gave up preaching. He just adapted his preaching for different audiences. Listen to any one of his famous speeches and tell me you don't hear the cadence and tone of the preacher. The necessity of having a view of the gospel that encompasses both spiritual and social realms is something African-American churches have upheld for decades and decades. The theology of society and culture we find in Dr. King and in African-American churches is one that is born out of the social location of black people in America. When you are part of a people that have been historically, systematically, and systemically oppressed and marginalized, you develop a view of God, a view of the Bible, and a view of society that says this oppression must be reversed. And my God and my Bible, if they speak to justice and reconciliation, must speak to that reversal. Martin Luther King Jr.'s influence has stretched far beyond his tragic assassination in 1968. His work was instrumental in the legislative victories of the civil rights movement, and his methods of nonviolent direct social action are still employed in churches around the world today. The prophetic voice of the black church in America is still heard in pulpits around the country and in many of the brightest and most challenging theologians in American history. If you're interested in exploring these themes further, you could check out any of the writings of James Cone, who is known as the father of black liberation theology, or Willie James Jennings, whose award-winning book, The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race, is essential in this conversation. Another resource, and perhaps more accessible, is Esau Macaulay's recent bestseller, Reading While Black. In that book, Macaulay admits that part of the reason most Americans are unfamiliar with the African American church and its theology, and ways of approaching the Bible, is because the best examples of the African American tradition live and speak in pulpits and Sunday school rooms, 
rather than being published in the realms of academia. So if you want to experience and learn more about the African-American church, you simply have to go. Go visit an African-American church. Perhaps you will see and experience the tension of hope and change that is in every sermon, speech, and writing of Martin Luther King Jr. Now we turn to the evangelical tradition. The evangelical tradition provides an illustrative counterpoint to the African-American ecclesial tradition, particularly regarding its approach to social and cultural issues. For the next few minutes, we'll be focusing primarily on white evangelicalism, or at least predominantly white evangelicalism, and using the evangelist Billy Graham as our representative example. It is, of course, true that there are black people, Latino and Latina people, and people of Asian descent who would also identify themselves as evangelical. However, in the U.S., evangelicalism has been predominantly white in its membership and its leadership. As with every tradition we will explore, evangelicalism is not monolithic. There is diversity of views and factions within evangelicalism. But as a whole, I believe Billy Graham provides a helpful example of the tradition's theology and of society and culture. Before we dive into Billy Graham's biography, though, it will be good to refine a couple of definitions relating to evangelicalism. In a linguistic sense, evangelical is an English word derived from the Greek word for good news or gospel. The Greek word is euangelion. In a theological and academic sense, though, the word evangelical refers to a person, church, or organization that is characterized by these four tenets. Conversionism, the belief that one must be born again or convert to Christianity. Biblicism, holding a high view of the Bible as the fundamental authority over one's life. Crucicentrism, the theological priority of Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross, and activism, defined as the need to actively share one's faith with others, what we might call evangelism. These four characteristics of evangelicalism were first outlined by David Bevington in his groundbreaking work on evangelicalism in Britain. The four together have come to be known as the Bebbington Quadrilateral. In the broader sociological world of the 21st century, the term evangelical has taken on a political reference, which is quite a bit more narrow and might be more akin to a term like fundamentalist. But the theological reference, defined by the Bebbington Quadrilateral, forms a fairly big tent that would include some Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Pentecostals, and even some Anglicans. Also, institutions like PBA that are interdenominational often use the term and tenets of evangelicalism to identify themselves. Billy Graham's Ministry and Crusades are particularly good examples of evangelicalism and its growth as a movement in the second half of the 20th century. Graham was born in 1918 and died just a few months before his 100th birthday in 2018. He rose to fame in America in the late 1940s when he began traveling the country holding revivals, or what would come to be called Crusades. The first great success of these crusades happened in Los Angeles in 1949. Graham and his fledgling organization had planned to do three weeks of services in the West Coast City, but the crowds were so large and continued to grow throughout the three weeks such that they extended the crusade to eight weeks. Graham continued to hold these crusades throughout the U.S. and around the world for the next six decades. His fame and popularity also gained him entry into the American political halls of power. He was an advisor to several U.S. presidents, especially Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, and he at least met 
with every U.S. president from Harry Truman to Barack Obama. According to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, the audience at Graham's Crusades totals more than 210 million people, and his radio and television audience is perhaps 10 times that number. He is probably the most recognizable and well-known religious figure of the past 100 years in America. With regard to Graham's theology of society and culture, he is a prime example of evangelicalism because he demonstrates a clear outworking of an emphasis on the spiritual aspects of preaching the gospel, and therefore provides a counterexample to the African-American ecclesial tradition with its emphasis on the social aspects alongside the spiritual aspects. And he is a prime example of evangelicalism because he also demonstrates in himself the perils of walking the political halls of power, and therefore provides a counterexample to the moral majority movement of the 1980s and 90s and the current state of evangelicalism in America in 2020. While Graham did believe that the gospel included a message of social justice, the emphasis of his preaching was on the heart change that the gospel brought to individuals. It was in Graham's preaching that the well-known phrase, accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, was popularized. We can see in this moment of acceptance language the evangelical emphasis on conversionism, Graham believed that this kind of significant heart change is what would bring about social and cultural change. So he articulated his preaching philosophy as simply and profoundly and exclusively preaching Christ crucified. Here we can see the evangelical emphasis on crucicentrism. But the success of Graham's preaching and crusades earned him quite a lot of influence in the political halls of Washington. So great was his influence among Southern white Christians that Richard Nixon fought hard to win an endorsement from Graham to secure his election to the presidency in 1968 and 1972. Graham eventually gave that endorsement and became a confidant to President Nixon right up to the Watergate scandal and all of the fallout associated with it. In the aftermath, Graham felt burned and betrayed by Nixon, and from that point forward kept some distance from presidents and political figures, and refused to explicitly allow himself or his organization to be used for political endorsement. Graham went so far as to say, in 2007, that evangelists cannot be closely identified with any particular party or person. We must stand in the middle in order to preach to all people, right and left. This kind of sentiment seems a far cry from the current state of evangelicalism in America, which has become closely associated with the Republican Party and with Donald Trump as the 45th U.S. President. Such a close association between 2020 evangelicalism and republicanism has even prompted religion writer Jonathan Merritt to dub Billy Graham as the last non-partisan evangelical. Evangelicalism as a movement has continued to evolve, though, in the 21st century, as I've alluded to in this discussion about partisanship. The size of the movement is well illustrated by the size of Graham's audiences, and its political influence can be seen in how Republican presidential candidates especially have courted the votes of white evangelicals over the past two decades. However, because of the big tent nature of evangelicalism and the nonpartisan stance of Billy Graham himself, the list of other figures who stand in the evangelical tradition is wide-ranging. Everyone from Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, Paula White, and Robert Jeff Jeffress, all of whom served in Donald Trump's Faith Advisory Council, to figures like Russell Moore, Beth Moore, and Tim Keller, all of whom have been outspoken against Trump, all of these could be said to stand in the evangelical tradition.
If you are interested in researching evangelicalism in the 21st century further, the books Believe Me by historian John Fea and Jesus and John Wayne by historian Kristen Cobes-Dumay would be good resources to check out.